You're listening to the More Than The Music Podcast, episode 21, featuring Jason Gray. It's awful. It's not the dream that anybody has, you know? And it's devastating and disorienting and healing takes a long time, you know? Maybe you don't ever completely heal. My pastor, he said once that the hope of Easter is not the kind of hope that you have when you are in the waiting room at the hospital and you hope the news isn't the worst. But the hope of Easter is for those who have already gotten the worst news. The death has happened, the marriage has ended, now what? So I'm, I'm, I'm in the now what season. You're about to hear how Jason Gray first heard from God through a Simon and Garfunkel song, how music helps him cope with a speech handicap, and how the songs on his album, Where the Light Gets In, are helping him heal after his divorce. I'm Justin Paul, along with Jason Gray, and we're going to talk about a lot more than just the music. More Than the Music is hosted by Justin Paul, a touring musician turned national radio personality who loves the dramatic, humorous, sometimes tragic, and often inspiring story behind the songs from your favorite artists. You can connect with the show at wayfm.com slash Justin. Now here's your host, Justin Paul. I'm so thrilled tonight to be joined by Mr. Jason Gray. How you doing? I'm doing great, and I'm so glad you're playing my record. Thank you so much. Well, Jason, let's start at the beginning. Yeah. How did Jason Gray get to where you are right now? How did you get to this point? Like, <laughs> Take me back to the beginning and how music influenced your life from the oh, very wow. start. Okay, well, um, I grew up on the road with my mom's bar band when I was a little boy, so I was on the road with her, and she would actually stick me on a bar stool and then go up on the stage and do the concert, and I'd be hanging out there with my root beer in the smoke, you know, and all that kind of stuff, and uh, hanging out with all the truck drivers, which may sound awful, but it was kind of an awesome way to grow up. Like, I loved it because they had to teach me how to play pool and all that, you know. (laughs) And then when I was in the fourth grade, she became a believer, and we went from singing in the bars to singing at church revivals. I'll tell you that the people in the churches were way more weird than the people at the bars. (laughs) Um, That was my experience anyway. But music was always very important to me. I didn't grow up in a Christian home at all. We weren't churchgoers, but I remember when I was a little boy, maybe in the first or second grade, I loved Simon and Garfunkel. And I loved the song, Bridge Over Troubled Water. And I remember as a little boy hearing that song, and something in my heart went, Psst, hey, this is how God feels about you. And You heard that in a Simon and Garfunkel song. In a Simon and Garfunkel song when I was a little boy. And what I think is remarkable about that, and I'm so grateful for about it, is that there wasn't anybody in my life to tell me that that was how I should interpret a song or so... It had to be the Holy Spirit, right? It uh, reminds me that God is able to make himself heard, and uh, he doesn't need our help or permission. The first time I heard the voice of God, it came to me through a Jewish agnostic pop singer. Well, I mean, it <laughs> is Simon. amazing when you say that, that God literally uses anything and everything to get our attention. It doesn't have to oh, be yeah. a Christian singer. It doesn't have to be something you hear on Way FM. God can use Simon and Garfunkel yeah. to reach Jason Gray. He can use anything yeah. to reach you. Yeah. So uh, I was first aware of how God would speak to me in music. And then as I was growing up, you know, I've, I, I, I've got a... S- I've got a speech handicap, you know, and so that made me very introverted and shy, you know, so I'd, I'd hide in my room a lot and I'd, I played a lot of music, you know, so music was um, a very intimate companion in all those years when I was growing up and was very, very healing to me, you know, and so I always knew that I, I wanted to be a part of that magic, whatever it was, you know. There's a quote by Frederick Buechner. He says that the place that you are called to is where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger intersect. And uh, I knew that music was the place where 
where my deep gladness and the world's deep hunger would meet. I knew that when I was when I was very young. Well, playing music in your room as a release and as a way yeah. out is a lot different than playing on the stages you're probably playing on now. Yeah. Was that intimidating at first, getting on a stage? Oh, uh, yeah. And, and playing songs that you probably played in your bedroom, but, you know, had never played in front of people. Oh, yeah. It, you know, I, I um, for a long time, I believed that my story would be that God would heal me of my speech handicap, and then I would go out into the world and, and speak and do music. And I would have this testimony of how uh, how he healed me, so now I can speak clearly, you know, when it was clear that he wasn't going to do that. And I used to argue with him about it, saying, Lord, you can't make me your spokesperson until you make it so I can speak. <laughs> and I don't know if you've ever had this experience or not, but when you t- t- tell God that he can't do something— it's like a dare that he can't resist, right? And so, um, but as I began to be aware that that's not the way it was going to work, it was terrifying, it was uh, humiliating, it was disappointing. But I began to understand that he didn't want to heal me of my speech impediment, but he wanted to heal me through my speech impediment. There were things that he wanted to accomplish in my heart that could only be accomplished me having a speech handicap, and then also beginning to understand that how helpful and healing me having a speech handicap would be to my audience, you know, mm. because uh, our weaknesses make us a safe place for each other. They reveal the grace of God in our lives, you know, and I'll, I'll talk more about that in a bit with a, a song I wrote on this new record. It deals specifically with that. That story sounds awfully familiar to one I've heard in the Bible before. Oh, yeah. You know which one I'm talking about. I bet you're talking about my boy Moses. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah and, and how he probably felt the same way. Uh-huh. But God said, no, this is how I've chosen to use you. Yeah. And Moses was obedient in that. Yeah. And, I mean, we're talking about Moses here. Look, know, at, right. look at how God used Moses yeah. in all of Scripture. And I think... Over time, we begin to recognize that our weakness is one of the great gifts in our lives because it's that place where we meet again and again with the Lord. It makes us dependent and open-handed and available to Him. You know, Our strengths are mostly only good for impressing each other, and, and they don't lead me to a place of dependence. A couple of years ago, my speech actu- actually began to clear up, and I was able to do like whole concerts without having any issues at all. And at first, I thought, "Finally, this is awesome!" And then, almost immediately after that, I began to be a little nervous about it. You know, mm. I talked with my pastor about it, and he said, I, "I know what you mean." He said, "I I need my weakness so much. I have come to depend on my weakness," and uh, I think it's. Beautiful that we are a part of a kingdom where we get to depend on our weakness. Yeah. You hear the stories of Moses. You hear the Jason Gray story, too. And I think that is so evident in in your music that how God is taking something that most people would consider a handicap and using it for his glory. Yeah. So let's jump. Let's jump into the music. The first song is learning. Tell me about learning and why it kicks off the record. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, my last record had a lot of pain on it, uh, had some songs about grief on it. And so I wanted to kick off the new album with a statement that was like, all right, it's a new season and something that felt optimistic. And I thought, well, you know, how about like an empowerment anthem? <laughs> and so here's the thing. I see how our c- culture loves empowerment anthems because we love to feel empowered. We get high on it. You're going to hear me roar, all that kind of stuff. I kind of can't stand empowerment anthems <laughs> because I think they ignore a lot of reality, you know. And so knowing that the people want an empowerment anthem, I thought, okay, so what's an empowerment anthem I could write that could be meaningful? And so I decided to write an empowerment anthem about failure. <laughs> and uh, Sounds like an oxymoron. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the grace of God that that allows us to 
get back up when we fall. And so it's empowerment based on the unfailing love of God. Cause I be like, hey, whatever comes my way, I'm not turning back. Hey, I know your love won't leave, so I won't worry. Cause if I fall, I win every time I get up again. Hey, Cause I can't lose if I keep learning. I'm learning. And Sparrows, too, the second track on the album. It's kind of based on that hymn, His Eye is on the Sparrow, in a way. Kind of a newer version of, of that idea, right? There are hundreds of verses in the Bible where God is saying in one way or another, do not be afraid. And one of my f- favorites is in Matthew chapter 6. Jesus is speaking, and it's as though he knows exactly how fragile we can be in all of our anxiety And so he uses the kindest of language and the gentlest of images when he says, look at the birds in the air, look at the flowers of the field, see how they are cared for and provided for, and aren't you worth so much more than birds and flowers? Hmm. And I was reading an article about how uh, over half of the world population struggles with chronic anxiety. So I thought... This is uh, a message that we we all need to remember. interesting guy i'm doing my research for this and i find that jason gray is is not just a musician but thank you for noticing yeah he he also has an interest in adult coloring books what is this now i know that sounds horrible when well, you say it <laughs> and they're not what you might normally think when you hear the word adult coloring books you know but there is a trend in our culture at this time where people have discovered how therapeutic it is for grown-ups to be able to have these elaborate designs that they can color. Yeah. And so uh, I thought, let's make one of those. So you're, are you always walking around with crayons and coloring pencils? And I mean, is this like just something you do when you have free time or? I feel like you're judging me right now. Well, I, 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 I would I'm like curious. to ask, how come you aren't walking around with crayons all the time? Because I'm too busy doing other things that, <laughs> oh, okay. that aren't as cool as adult coloring books. <laughs> Actually, like markers. Okay. Markers are my... Adult marker books. Of choice. Maybe. Yeah. What do you enjoy about it? Like, what is it? Well, I'm uh, in this relationship with a woman who loves them, and it has become a sweet thing that we get to do together. So it's about companionship. And there are even Jason, official Jason Gray coloring books that I can buy. We are developing and producing a Jason Gray coloring book that will go along with each of the songs on the new record. Wow. Yeah. Another interesting thing about Jason is you're a reader. Like, man, you're, you're diving in books all the time. I am the complete opposite. I waste my time on other dumb things like uh, wrestling and the WWE while you're sitting and reading probably eloquent words that are written. War and Peace. Yeah. And the Brothers Karamazov. <laughs> but Dostoevsky. Yes, yes. I don't know what you're saying right now, <laughs> but it sounds highly intelligent. <laughs> So I wanted to play a little game with you. I, I took some famous quotes yes. from wrestlers and some famous quotes from books, and I wanted to see if you could distinguish between the two. Okay. Because I think this is a good, a good point to show just how I waste my time on dumb things, and you're very intelligent, and uh, you don't waste your time on dumb things. You actually read books. I wouldn't assume any of those things about <laughs> me, but, but let's go for it. All right, so I'm going to read this as if I were reading it. In a book. Okay. No respect, no honor. There is no honor among thieves in the first place. But he put hard times on me and my family. Is that from a book or is that from a wrestler? I'm going to say that that's from uh, the works of uh, 
Monster of Mayhem, Marvin. <laughs> is that a wrestling name you just made up? <laughs> I, yeah, I just I just made that up. I don't know. Uh, well, you are correct. It is from a wrestler, Dusty uh, Rhodes. Oh, Dusty uh, Rhodes. 1985. I, the American I Dream, Dusty was... Rhodes. He put hard times. Ric Flair put hard times on me and my family. Make my liver quiver, my knees shiver. I always get him confused with Marvin, the monster <laughs> of mayhem. Shoot. All right. Okay, so uh, I, I got a couple more for you. All is right. this one from a book? Or was it a famous line by a wrestler? Yeah. Nothing means nothing. I'm unjustifiably in a position that I'd rather not be in, but the cream of the crop will rise to the top. <laughs> Is that from a book or from a WWE wrestler? I'm going to tell you, some of these wrestlers should be writing books. Because <laughs> that's beautiful. They do, actually. I've, okay. uh, I've talked with a few of them. I, you know, I, I read those books. Yeah, uh, Jesse Ventura who was the governor of the state of Minnesota, Yeah, a pro wrestler. He wrote a book called I Ain't Got Time to Bleed. <laughs> and uh, we always tease him uh, saying, I ain't got time to read. <laughs> so, That's me. I don't, I don't have time to read because I'm watching wrestling. And I'm going to say out. it's a wrestler. You're right. That's Macho Man Randy Savage, Macho 1987. Macho oh, Man Randy Savage of the year. And... <laughs> All right, one more. All wrestler right. or book. I know that over the last several months, I've lost a lot of things. And one of those things has been my smile. I know it doesn't mean a lot to everyone else, but it means something to me. That's a sad wrestler. <laughs> that sounds like Hammerhead Hank. <laughs> <laughs> After he fell to... Uh, I'm kidding. I don't know. So you're saying it's a wrestler too? Sure, I'll say it's a wrestler. You got it, man. Jeez. Oh, I mean, yeah. obviously, I don't read enough books because I put all wrestler <laughs> comments on here. That's Shawn Michaels, 1995, mm. when he had to give up the championship because he was hurt. Oh. Yeah. He did write a book too. I've, I've read his book. We'll see. It's probably not as good as any of the other things you just rattled off a minute ago, but... It's not as good as Hammerhead Hank's <laughs> memoir about his adventures... With Monster of Mayhem, Marvin, and the adventures they had together. If you were a wrestler, if you were, uh, if you were going to come up with a name for yourself, oh. what would it be? Maybe okay. You think that I, I read a lot, so, uh, and they say that readers are leaders. So I could be, readers are bleeders, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> uh, jumping in uh, back to the music. I Will Rise is the next song on the album. Tell me a little bit about that and the place where you wrote it. Yeah, you know, I wrote that with a few fr friends of mine, including a guy named Ross King. And he and I were both kind of in stages of grief over an unexpected l l loss in our lives and uh, reeling from, from disillusionment and disappointment with God and wondering what do we believe, you know, in a world where where these things could happen, you know. And we were talking about it, like how if there were a mastermind who wanted to destroy our belief and he, he came up with a plan of how he would do that, that plan would look exactly like what happened in our lives, you know. And uh, in the midst of that, we're also aware of, of James chapter 1 that says, uh, Consider it joy when you endure many trials because we know that trials produce perseverance and perseverance produces maturity. We know that the kind of shakeup that we were in the midst of is exactly the kind of thing that produces the most change it uh transforms you. And so we, we wanted to make an anthem that acknowledged <laughs> the harsh realities and the transformation that comes up out of that. I will rise again. I will rise again.
feel like listening to the record, a lot of the songs are just that. They're written from a place of pain, but yet hopeful for a place of triumph. Yeah. And you're dealing with something right now that a lot of people have dealt with, and that's divorce. You announced yeah. in January that uh, your marriage had ended. You can hear that realness and the pain and the brokenness of that in these songs. Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's awful. It's not the dream that anybody has, you know. And it's devastating and disorienting and healing takes a long time, you know. Maybe you don't ever completely heal, you know. My pastor, he said once that the hope of Easter is not the kind of hope that you have when you are in the waiting room at the hospital and you hope the news isn't the worst that you're afraid of. But the hope of Easter is for those who have already gotten the worst news. The death has happened. The marriage has ended. Now what? So I'm, I'm, I'm in the now what season. There is a, a devotion by Oswald Chambers, and he talks about how important it is to grieve the thing that went wrong, but then arise and do the next thing. And I would say that this album is about arising and doing the next thing. Mm -hmm. It makes it especially tough walking through that with kids involved and it's, it's all, terrible. all of that stuff. How's that process been since? It's more horrible than anybody can say. And I expected it would be horrible, but it's, it's, um, it feels like an open wound in the world that isn't going to heal on this side of heaven. And yet there is good work to do yet. And uh, I believe that God loves me. I believe he loves my ex-wife. I believe he loves my ch children. And uh, yeah, it's, it's all just very complicated. I think that anger is an easier emotion than pain. Yeah. And so a lot of people, when they can't take the pain of it anymore, they allow it to harden into, in, into anger. And uh, all I can say is um, I'm trying my best to not do that and just kind of authentically grieve and just kind of weather all of that and, and see where, where it takes me. There is a quote by uh, an author named Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, and she wrote the Stages of Grief book. The most beautiful people we have known are those who have known defeat, known s suffering, known struggle, known loss, and have found their way out of the depths. These people have an appreciation, a sensitivity, and an understanding of life that fills them with compassion, gentleness, and a deep loving concern. Beautiful people do not just happen. Mm. So that's my hope at this yeah. point is is that it's it's going to make me a better listener, person who loves better. It removes j j judgment from your life. It uh, teaches you forgiveness. <laughs> mm. You know, there are certain things that you can't learn any other way other than just going through great difficulty. Suffering is a is a great teacher. So I'm. I'm learning a lot. Yeah. And knowing that and listening to songs like Death Without a Funeral, mm -hmm. would you say a, a part of you did die with that marriage? Yeah. There's a, a line in the chorus that says, uh, if you see me, I'm still breathing, though a million things have died inside of me. And yeah, I, f I feel that. If I'm to be honest, I feel that a lot of the time when it happened, I felt like it broke my belief and it broke my prayer and it broke my worship. Like all of those mm. things were broken in my life and I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know how to worship. I didn't know how to believe. I didn't know what I believed, you know. I think all that is natural and I ch chose to not be anxious about it but to be curious about it and say, well, Lord, I, I can't make these things happen happen so here I am I'm 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 broken I, I don't have much of anything to offer but here I am you know mm -hmm. which is an invitation I suppose for him to put me back together piece by piece differently <laughs> yeah 
which is a line in the song that we're t- talking about. I'm not who I was. You won't recognize me. Love came down and redefined me and piece by piece put me back together differently. So I knew on this record that I wanted to have a song ab- about the divorce that acknowledged it and addressed it, which is tricky because there's a lot of anger, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of confusion around all of that, you know. So how do I write a song that could be helpful and not just be something I do for my own emotional relief, you know, but that would hopefully help people feel less alone because a lot of people have gone through this. And it is very lonely. In a lot of ways, it's harder than if your spouse died. Mm. Because if a person that you love dies, everybody gathers around and you have the funeral and you get to honor the history that you had together and you have signifying markers that bring closure. This is the end. And everybody's there, you know, and it helps you to lay that down and to grieve and then to heal. A divorce is kind of hard because there's no place to bury all these things, you know. And uh, I think people don't exactly know what to do in the midst of all that so they don't come around. So it can be very lonely and it's it's harder it's more complicated to grieve all of that and then to heal so um i wanted to write a song that was kind of like a funeral song for the people who who have experienced that or the death of a dream or any kind of a disappointment you know the end of the song closes with a verse about an apple and that came from uh, after the divorce. I was about to leave my house. I saw that there was an apple, one apple hanging in the tree. It was the last apple of the season. And it was uh, hanging in the tree that I'd planted with my wife. We had actually planted two trees. <laughs> and a few years ago when a storm came through, it blew one of them down. That's its own song, I suppose, wow. in the future. <laughs> but there was this one apple left. And I had to leave my house for a tour, and uh, I knew I wasn't going to be home for a while. So something in my heart um, compelled me to go grab the apple, and I felt like I was supposed to eat it. And I didn't know why. I didn't know what it would mean, but I had a sense that it would be meaningful. And so I went and climbed up there, and I picked the apple, and I hopped in my car, and I drove. And all day that apple was just sitting there in the car with me, and it was just heavy on my mind and and finally I just ate it and I was crying and I was angry and I was surprised because the apple was still so sweet you know and it became very symbolic to me of of, um, the value of our history together and the hope of the future you know and uh, I'm still understanding what that apple means and so i don't want to explain it too much and just kind of leave it up to the holy spirit to make it to mean whatever it needs to mean for whoever's hearing it when you see me i'm still breathing though a million things have died inside of me but there's no heat Without grieving No wonder why it's hard to rest in peace When there's nothing we can bury in the dirt No place to lay the memory With divorce and with a lot of pain that people do go through It feels like an open wound that that never heals And the song, The Wound is Where the Light Gets In, is talking about that process and how there is hope, but you may never completely heal from this wound. You know, the thing that I'm most grateful for about the way the kingdom of God works is that we have a place to bring all of our wounds, the worst 
that has happened to us, the worst that we've done to others, all of that mess. We bring all that brokenness, whether it's addiction, depression, divorce, failure, loss, sickness, whatever it may be. We bring that again and again to our Father who is able to work all things together for the good of those who love him. And he takes all that mess and he makes something beautiful out of it. He makes a better you out of it. You know, mm. I heard this quote that wisdom is healed pain. And I know everybody hearing this right now that you have wisdom that costs you a great deal, but it's yours now. And it's yours to spend on everybody that you meet. We find that the things that we go through uniquely equip us to be able to bring God's mercy to other people who are going through the same thing. It makes us a safe place for others. And this is a part of the way that I believe that God heals us. He He heals us by making us healers, mm. you know? And uh, I love that because the things that might have ruined us actually transform us into a force for healing in the world. So it's kind of like our best revenge. And so we are not intimidated by the hell on earth that we can experience at times because we know that it, it, it has within it the power in God's hands to make us more who, who we most want to be. So these things do not get to have the last word over our lives, but our Father and His, His love has the final word over our lives. And the wound is where the light gets in. It's tricky how the heart works when the breakups and the big jerks make us never want to hurt that way again. Maybe I'm naive, but in every scar I see the place where love is trying to break in. Cause the wound is where the light gets in. You said on your website, when you announced the divorce, you said, though it is not the story anyone hopes for, it is the story I am in. And by God's grace and with the help of friends and family, I will do my best. I will do the best I know to bring my brokenness before the Lord again and again and pray that I may become wiser, gentler, more compassionate, kinder, a better minister, listener, friend, and human. And to do this with the hope that nothing is wasted and that even, even this can be made beautiful. That struggle, you can hear it in the songs, you can hear it as you talk about it. It's still very real, but you haven't lost that hope. You haven't lost the vision that God does still have something in store for you. Well, it depends on the day, but uh, I'd say there are more and more days where I have a sense of hope. I remember I was on the road shortly after the divorce was, was... was finalized. I was out on the road with Big Daddy Weave and I was just burnt out and I was hurting and disillusioned. And again, my prayer was broken. My belief was broken. My worship was broken, but I still had to earn money, Mm -hmm. you know? So I go out on tour and I think, okay, I only have to play for for half an hour each night. Great. I can do that. And then I'm just going to go hide in my bunk, you know? But um, that tour was like a hospital on the road, you know? And um, they do a thing each night where they have an altar call. Anyone who needs prayer comes up, and then the artists go down and pray for people. And I thought, I'm just so burned out, and I I don't know if I'll be much good to anybody. So I don't know if I should go down and pray for people. But I've cultivated a habit in my life where— I try to put myself in the path of the Holy Spirit so that if God's moving by, I'm going to get hit by something, you know? Mm. And uh, I didn't feel like I had a, a lot to offer, but I wanted to be where the Holy Spirit was moving, you know? So I, first evening of the tour, altar call happens, and I decide to go down and pray with people. And uh, every night, of that first week of the tour, the people who ended up in my line without knowing anything about my story were people whose relationship was in trouble and uh, maybe had had an affair or who knows what was going on. I thought, wow, I I know how to pray for these people. This is the Mm -hmm. one thing 
I feel qualified to do right now, you know. And uh, I felt like it was the Holy Spirit encouraging me, reminding me that I I still have good work to do. Yeah. And uh, I felt very grateful. And that was the beginning of healing and hope for my f- future. It has to be humbling, too, as a musician, to be able to write songs about brokenness, to be able to write songs about hope that are helping you heal in the process. But as you perform them, you start to hear stories back of how people are impacted through your stories. Yeah. One of the ones that I'm most grateful for is uh, I was doing a show in Cincinnati, and there was a a man who came up to me after the show. He's a police officer. And uh, he said, hey, I just want you to know I used your song to talk a guy off of the ledge earlier this week. Wow. And, uh, I wanted to thank you for that. And that's so humbling. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know? a, a Jason Gray song helped literally save a life of someone contemplating ending their life. It, it's kind of like the, the parable of the loaves and the fishes, you know, because I'm just sitting in a room by myself, cobbling together words and a few chords and hope that it sounds nice, you know, and uh, it's a very modest offering. And yet so often I'm grateful to hear back about how much it accomplishes, you know. Mm -hmm. We share a mutual friend in Mm -hmm. uh, Katie and I texted her earlier and I asked her, I said, tell me something about Jason Gray. I might not know. Yeah. And Here's what she said. She said, I have never seen anyone fight so hard in such a godly way. He's taught me so much. Huh. Well, that's generous. I would say I I do fight, but very, very imperfectly. <laughs> and uh, have made great mistakes that have um, taught me so much about the unfailing love of God and the grace of God. On a lighter note, I yeah. go on Instagram... And I see Jason Gray cracking jokes left and right, like Instagram videos. Are you a comedian in your next career? I mean, what's well, what, what's this about? Okay, so I do use a lot of humor at my shows, and people often, you know, t- 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 tell me afterwards, you know, hey, you know, if the music thing doesn't work out, you could be a comedian, and that's so sweet, and I'm so glad that that's how they experience me. However, it's pretty easy to get a laugh at a concert because. Nobody's expecting to laugh at a concert. <laughs> I think it'd be terrifying to be a comic because you walk out on the stage to a group of people who are there who are like, all right, what you got? Make me laugh. Make me laugh. <laughs> Amuse me. You know, I just think those are the bravest entertainers in the world. So if you, need a, if you need a good laugh today, go uh, find Jason, <laughs> uh, Jason uh, on Instagram, Jason Gray on Instagram, and, uh, and get yourself a nice little laugh today. Now, I'm struggling with, with Jason because my wife's grandmother calls me Jason, yeah. and other people call me Jason. My name's Justin, and then people call me Jason. Does that work? With like, a, do people call you Justin? Dude, I was on a tour with Sh- Sh- Sean McDonald and down here, and we were in Dallas, Texas. And uh, the guy who brought us in, man, he was all about Sean McDonald, and he did not give a rip about us at all. And uh, when he went to introduce everybody, he goes, all right, you guys, I'm so excited for you guys here, Sean McDonald tonight. But first, Down Under and Justin Gray. <laughs> so it does happen to you, too. You got them both wrong, yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, I've I've been with my wife for 11 years, okay? We dated for seven. We've been married almost, well, almost 12 years now. I've been married almost five. Yeah. And her grandmother, to this day, still calls me Jason. It's good to know it works in reverse, and I'm yeah. not the only one. People call Jason Gray, Justin Gray. Jason, I'm so excited to feature this entire album, Where the Light Gets In. Thank you so much for being here. This yeah, has been man. amazing. Thank you so much for having me. You've been listening to the More Than The Music Podcast, episode 21, featuring Jason Gray. If you've enjoyed this episode, or any others, would you kindly give the show a five-star rating and review inside iTunes? Your five-star rating and review would be greatly appreciated. I'm Justin Paul. To connect with the show, and to even have a chance to win a copy of Jason Gray's Where the Light Gets In, which was featured in this episode, just go to wayfm.com slash Justin.